recently got your first leadership gig, loving the new role, but feeling the pressure of your new responsibilities and all that expectation to perform? Well, don't worry, you're not alone. Crossing the chasm from a technical role to leadership, from doing stuff to managing and leading people is the toughest challenge any leader must make. Welcome to the Human Edge Show, the podcast dedicated to help you do just that, successfully cross the doing to leading chasm. Campbell Such here, Chief Chasm Crossing Guide. I've made all the mistakes so you don't have to. I want to help you learn those lessons much more easily by sharing my experiences and talking with brilliant people who have already figured it out. You'll get great actionable tips, strategies and techniques to make the transition so much easier and faster for you. Now let's get to it. Welcome to another episode of the Human Edge Show. Today, I'm really privileged to have Paul Littlefair from the BNZ with me. Paul, welcome to the show. It's great to have you on board. Thanks, Campbell. It's great to be here. Marvellous. Paul is General Manager, Technology at Bank of New Zealand. Paul has held several senior technology roles in the financial services industry, including ASB, Kiwi Bank and Bank of South Pacific. He has broad expertise and experience across cloud, agile, software delivery, DevOps, data, infrastructure, and architecture. Paul was a recipient of the New Zealand CIO of the Year, having won this prestigious, very prestigious award in 2019 while CIO at Livestock Improvement Corporation. He lives in Wellington, having migrated to New Zealand in 1998, and has international experience working in the UK, the USA, Australia, and the South Pacific, and of course, New Zealand. So welcome to the show, Paul. Just to kick off, What's something that not too many people would know about you? Oh, that's a, yeah, that's a great question. Um, probably a couple of things. I mean, first of all, um, my undergraduate degree was in oceanography and chemistry. I did a, uh, I, I did a, uh, I, uh, I did a uh, combined degree. Um, and I think, um, with all due respect to all the oceanographers out there, um, the thing my oceanography degree taught me was that I didn't want to be an oceanographer, um, and I spent most of my time messing around with computers trying to uh, trying to do um, you know, modelling of uh, of estuarine mixing patterns um, in, in in computers. So uh, so um, yeah, hence the the move into IT. And probably the other thing is uh, actually my first career was as a sailing instructor. So. Um, that was, uh, yeah, that's kind of uh, how I got my start uh, in life um, as a working person. So quite a big change to go from a very outdoorsy kind of um, you know, industry um, to then, you know, coming in and, and, and working in the office, delivering multi-million dollar projects for large corporates. So, um, yeah, quite a bit of a change. So, yeah, I'd probably say those things. Yeah, well, interesting background to come into IT, as you say. And sailing instructor, any particular size, range, type of boat that you were that you were teaching people to sail? Oh, yeah. Look, I I was a bit of a jack of all trades. I uh, I, I, I taught windsurfing uh, right the way up to uh, on, on some big on some big boats. Um, primarily, I would say I I, I kind of specialised um, in, in in dinghies, um, so lasers, forty um, niners, the sorts of things. People may have seen at, at the Olympics um, that, that are on at the moment. Uh, so uh, yeah, certainly not as good as the uh, New Zealand sailors, though. Uh, I will say, which is probably why I, uh, I moved away and uh, <laughs> found a job in the warmth. <laughs> yeah, there's some pretty awesome capability in sailing in New Zealand, right? It's just a big coastline, lots of water. So, Paul, just if you can cast your mind back, and, I'm, and I know it's not that far back, um, to your early forays and steps into leadership, what were some of the things that that you found that that uh, made a difference to you? What sort of a, was there some epiphanies that you had, and, and what would you suggest to new leaders moving into a new role based on that? So maybe some mistakes to avoid. Yeah, sure. Um, yeah, great. I mean, it's a it's a great question, and and and. Um, you know, there's there's no there's no real simple answers, but there are definitely some things that 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 you can do um, when you when you get that first role um, as 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 a leader. Um, you know, the the first thing I I tend to tell people is is a leader's job job is not is not just to go around telling everybody what to do. Um, quite often, um, it's, a, it's something that new leaders um, kind of go, "Great, um, I'm suddenly now in charge of these people." Right, it's my job just to spend my time um, telling them, um, you know, what to do and, and and how to do it. And uh, 
yeah, I'm very keen that that with with leaders we we talk a lot more about trying to trying to set goals, um, trying to set the vision, um, trying to be clear about what success looks like, what outcomes are required, and then trying to utilize the expertise of the people in your team to deliver that, um, because quite often. You know, especially when you get first promoted, you, you, you know, there is often a bit of ego that goes with it. And you go, great, I've been promoted because I know better than anybody else. And before you know it, you're kind of going, yeah, my opinion is is the opinion that counts. And, um, yeah, I think I think trying to, trying to have a level of humility, right? So there are some key things. I mean, leadership also, if you go too far the other way, you can start moving into that abdication space. There's nothing worse than a you know than a leader when you go to a leader and you go, you know, what should we be doing? And the leader goes, I don't know, you tell me. And you know, keeps delegating everything straight back to you all the time. Um, so you can go too far. So it's really finding the balance between those 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 kinds of, of of extremes. And you know, if you reflect back to leaders that you've you've worked with or or even um I, I quite often talk to people to to, to reflect on their, their school education um, and think about those teachers and, and leaders you've worked with that you respected. Um, yeah, and what did they do to, to, to earn your respect? And you know, things they would normally do is they would hold you accountable. Um, you know, if I think back to the teachers at school who got the best out of me were the ones that I did my homework for, right? And, you, you know, I couldn't just... <laughs> you know, sort of try and charm my way out of things and go, oh, yeah, the dog ate it or don't worry. And, you know, teachers that you, know, you cut your lot of slack um, or wanted to be your friend, um, yeah, quite often you might have liked them, but they weren't necessarily the people that got the best out of you. Uh, and in hindsight, they were, were not necessarily the, the leaders that you you, you respected, um, respected the most. So, you know, yeah, you do need to hold people to account. You need to be clear about what we're doing, where we're going, what the goals are, what success looks like. You know, you do need to hold the bar, um, but at the same time, you know, find that balance and, and also allow people to find their own way. Just because you might do it a certain way doesn't mean that's the best way. And quite often, you know, you'll stifle innovation, you'll stifle creativity, you'll you'll um, you'll you'll tend to you know squash the the teamwork that might go on, it, it, you know, if you become too dictatorial. So it's that balance between dictatorial and laissez-faire, right? And it's it's trying really hard to find that middle ground. And I think the other thing I would say is that you're probably going to get it wrong, you know, when in your early days, um, you know, experience is is a is a great you know, is 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 a great teacher as well, um, and you know, it's it's like learning to ride a bicycle. Um, sometimes you just got to get on the bike and just do it, and and be prepared that you know you might you might fall off as long as you as long as you don't fall off in front of a bus, then you'll be fine. Um, so you know, try and try and find a safe environment. Try and talk to people and say, hey, look, this is my first leadership job. You know, I'm not abdicating, but this is what we're going to do. Please give me some feedback. Try and have that humility that we talked about. You know, give give your people the opportunity to to provide that feedback to you. Um, and then, when you do get the feedback, you need to treat it with respect, even if it's things you don't want to hear. Um, and quite often, if you do get feedback, um, you know, you need to try and make the individual who provided it to you feel positive about giving it to you. You may you may decide that actually you don't agree with it um, and that's fine, but, you know, try not to dismiss it because if you become dismissive, you know, you're probably going to, um, you're not going to nurture those, those, those feedback loops um, with, um, with, with people. So, um, yeah, look, I probably rambled on a bit there and I've brought in a number of different elements um, to that, but, but I think those are the, some of the things that, that people should, should focus on. Yeah, that's uh, that's great. It is quite, it is a, a good range of things. One of the one of the first things you touched on there, Paul, was accountability, and you you related it back to to, the, to your school days and and your teachers and the respect that you had and the difference between liking and respect or liking and respect. Um, in a in a team situation, when you've come from a a doing role and into a leadership role, your experience is probably being held accountable if you had a, a leader you respected and who was good. When, when you kind of stand in the mirror and look or you flip it around, you're on the other side of the coin having to hold people accountable, what, 
what sort of things do you do or what would you suggest, especially for an early stage leader, but for anyone that's in leadership, how do you hold people accountable? Yeah, so um, uh, I mean, look, there, there are there are various models and tool sets that you'll that you'll come across during your leadership journey. Um, it's a bit tongue in cheek, but I, I I always say there's there's nothing that a consultant can't prove with a geometric shape, whether it be a, a two by two grid, a triangle, a circle, um, you know, something on a slide. Um, but one of the things I I, I quite um, like using <laughs> yeah. is uh, is, uh, is something called the success triangle. Um, which basically just talks about three things. Um, so it says for success, you need to be clear because people need to understand. They need clarity. If 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 um, if the requirements are vague, um, if you know, if there's a lot of ambiguity, um, you know, if if it, if it looks like you're being indecisive in your vision or, or, or what your target is, um, you will struggle and. That's no different from, you know, I mean, when you were a technical expert and you had requirements to build, you would want clarity in your requirements, right? It's very hard to know what you're doing if if you don't have that that clarity. So as a leader, you need to be clear about what success looks like. So if you're going to hold people accountable, then you need to give them, you know, specific things and you need a level of specificity. And so, um, you know, go back to the teacher example, you know, your homework will be in on Friday at four o'clock, right? And it's clear, right? And there's no ambiguity and there's no arguing. And look, there may be some reasons why and, you know, the dog the dog may have literally eaten your homework and there was nothing you could do about it. Um, but, you know, providing that clarity around your expectations is really important and setting those up front. And in fact, expectation management just is such a critical thing um, in terms of in terms of our work anyway. Just you know, whether it's <laughs> whether it's leading people or dealing with customers or um, uh, you know um, uh, putting great software into into production. That there's this whole um, uh, thing around um, yeah making making sure that happens. So so there's the clarity. You have got to be clear and. When you set those expectations up front, if they're unachievable, it gives people the opportunity to have a discussion with you there and then, right? So, you know, if a teacher said, oh, you'll have that done in 10 minutes and it wasn't going to be done in 10 minutes, then, you know, opportunity to speak up and say, excuse me, um, I'm, I'm afraid I'm not going to be able to deliver that because you don't want to have that argument when people are failing, right? So so provide the clarity up front. The, the next thing is, is then the capability. Um, and so, you know, you need to make sure that the people you're setting targets for um, are capable of delivering it. And that's kind of two things, right? So capability might be uh, a reflection on them as individuals. So, um, you know, some of us are, are you know, capable of, 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 of different things. I am not capable of running the Olympic 100 metres and winning a gold medal. Let's be very clear about that. I'm very comfortable that that is not one of my capabilities. So, yeah. um, you know, and and so, uh, you know, you may want, I don't know, you might you might want some backups done. It's no good going and talking to your probably your React developer about, you know, I, I need a whole bunch of, you know, um, um, cloud, cloud backups done. They may not have the capability. They may not have the interest. Um, so there's capability around people. There's also capability around sort of just the environment, the tools and equipment. You know, you might have a very capable person, but you may have put them in an environment where they are not capable of, of doing those things because they don't have what they need. They don't have the support um, around them. So you need to you need to understand your capability um, because you you want to you want to dial everything up for success as best you can. So you give the right job to the right person. You put them in an environment where they got the right tools and the equipment, and then things to do. And then the last piece is motivation, right? Because you can be clear, people can be highly capable, and if we're not motivated, then it just won't happen, right? And and motivation is really the piece that comes back to your, you know, your culture, um, how people are, you know, prepared to do things. Because um, while we may work in a, in a technology industry, and I, you know, talk about the ones and zeros and the fact that we all like dealing with computers. Um, the reality is that that this is a this is a business that revolves around people, 
Um, and 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 so we might like talking about shiny widgets and you know networks and cloud stuff, but at the end of the day, it is it is still a people business, and you know you you will have to motivate people um, to 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 make sure you get the outcomes um, that you need. And the key with motivation is that some of it comes from you. So as a leader, you need to set bring the energy into the room. You need to bring positivity into the room. Um, you can have a really positive team, and if a real negative leader turns up and says, "Oh, I've been asked by you know the CEO to do this, this, and this, and I don't think we're going to achieve it," but you know, over to you guys. <laughs> you know, <laughs> chances of getting success are, are probably remote. So you, yeah. you 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 have to bring. Positivity, you have to bring the energy. Once again, you need to find the balance. So it's no good being over the top uh, because you're just then seen as, you know, just a just a cheerleader. Um, you know, you have to be authentic and bring bring your authentic self. But, but you do have to take a deep breath and, and say, I'm going to bring the energy, I'm going to help motivate people. But you also then need to look at you know how 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 people are intrinsically motivated as well. I mean, you know, most most people love being part of a good team. Most people love being given interesting work to do. You know, most people turn up every day to do great work, right, and to be recognised for that great work. And so, you know, if once again you can set those 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 sort of criteria around yourself, um, bring people into good teams, make the work interesting and varied, um, you know, align the right things, then once again, you know, your, your motivation will go will, will go pretty pretty well. Yeah. Yeah, well, that's. Uh, I, love, I like the. I like the 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 idea of it's three simple things. The only thing I'm really disappointed around Paul is that the first two started with C. <laughs> yeah, <well, laughs> we're we're three C, shouldn't we? Yeah. <laughs> that's really interesting um, around capability and motivation. BJ Fogg uh, has written a really interesting book called uh, Tiny Habits, and he talks about the. Uh, I don't know if you've read that, but between the, the balance between motivation and capability, if you've got really high motivation but low capability, or you've got really high capability and low motivation, stuff ain't going to happen. And, and there's a curve. If you draw one on each axis, you, there's a sort of an exponential or a hyperbolic curve that runs between them. And you need to be above the curve and stuff will happen. And if you're below the curve, either with not enough motivation or not enough capability, stuff won't happen or be really hard to make to make happen. Um, interesting, too, that you talk on, on both the leader bringing stuff around motivation and also the intrinsic piece. And there's a lot of work that, you know, historically, we thought it was all about the stick and the carrot. And there's more and more information around the science of intrinsic motivation being one of the key motivators to get people to do things these days. Um, do you have any thoughts around how you uncover people's intrinsic motivation? Because that's tying, because everyone's motivated according to the theory. It's just a matter of finding the motivation that links to whatever it is you're trying to get them to do. Do you have any thoughts on in that space and um, that, uh, that might help? Oh, yeah. I don't know whether they'll help. I, I, I... I have a lot of opinions, um, that's for sure. Um, so, uh, yeah, I mean, going back to what you said earlier around, um, yeah, when I was the first, when, you know, got my first leadership role um, and some of the, the, the insights that, 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 that I had and some of the mistakes I made along the way um, was that, you know, there was this nuance between, you know, uh, growing up with my parents, my parents had 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 very strong values. Um, one of them was, you know, and do unto others as as you would have those do to you, right? I mean, you know, what's good for you tends to be good good for everybody else, right? And and there are definitely standards, right? I mean, every everybody likes recognition, right? So, you know, it's important that that you know one of the things in your leadership toolkit is the ability to recognize people when they've done good work. Once again, you have to be authentic about it. There's nothing worse than someone who turns up every five minutes and goes, that was a brilliant job when people fundamentally go, mm, actually, that was a pretty average job. I don't need the boss telling me I did a great job when I didn't. So, you know, you've, you've got to be authentic. You've, you've got to find it. But when it happens, your part of your role is to stand in and, and recognise people. And, and we all want recognition. And that's the standard thing. But the nuance piece is, you know, while we all like a certain level you'll find as a leader that we're all different, right? And I mean, it sounds quite obvious, but, you know, I've never met anyone who didn't like recognition, but some people love recognition where they get on stage in front of a whole crowd of people cheering and going bananas and somebody going, and here's, a, here's an award for you. And for other people, they hate it. That is their complete antithesis. 
And for them, you know, a handwritten note discreetly left on their desk that just says, hey, I just wanted to take the time to say what an awesome job you did last week on blah, 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 is, is huge, is absolutely huge, right? So, so there's the standard of, you know, recognition is good for everybody. But how you recognize people, there's, there's, these, real, there's these real nuances um, you know, between these, between these, um, between these specific things, and so, uh, you know, the the, the 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 key for me is is you know understanding you know what people's strengths and weaknesses are, um, and and trying to understand those particular pieces around them, which then helps you start to understand you know what their likely motivators and their sense of purpose is right. Um, and and so you know this this whole kind of treat everybody the same yet to a level, <laughs> but then you know get to know your team, get to know your people, uh, and how do you do that? You 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 have to find a way of spending time with them, um, and you have to find a way of of spending time with them um, in environments where you know people are under pressure or choices and decisions are being made. Sitting in a room where everybody's just quietly getting on with work in a library. You're probably not going to learn a lot, um, but it's it's those times where um, you know key decisions are having to be made when you know potentially pressure meetings and things are coming together, and you know you just you just observe people, you just see what roles they're taking, you know how they um, are, are, are playing things, um, how they're putting things forwards. The extroverts, when they're under pressure like me, will just talk, talk, talk. <laughs> the introverts will just sort of sit and stare off and. You know, people think they're not doing anything, but of course, what they're doing is deeply absorbing and reflecting, you know, on the information that's coming and and processing. And you know, most introvert, introverts are almost just about ready to make a statement, and then the extrovert says something, and it spins them off on a new thought analysis pattern. So, it, you know, you kind of have to manage those um, those pieces um, pieces as well. But going back to my original point, it is a people game, and you do need to. You do need to spend time with your people and understand. Um, and and you can, I mean, you can even ask them, right? When you know, when when you when you get to know people and you 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 have your your, your one on ones with them, you can you can say, hey, um, you know, what does a good day at work look like to you? You know, or what's the worst thing that could happen in a meeting? You know, and and just ask people about you know those sort of scenarios, um, and 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 start trying to you know trying to break that down. Yeah, yeah. So it starts to. Over time, you build a picture, and the picture is built out of what they tell you and how you observe them, and not just how you observe them. It's how uh, when they when things are going well, but also how you observe them and how they act and respond, and what triggers them when the pressure goes on to help you with that. Um, yeah, and the, and the piece about uh, rewarding, you know, re- recognizing people—that's really powerful because it's it, it would ease, be easy to get to think, "Hey, I love it." I love being recognized with an award and all the cheering and think everyone's the same because we tend to do that, right? We tend to think everyone's the same as us. So a real, a real epiphany perhaps for you through that, and, and you know, I'm just I'm surmising here, was that you worked that out, or perhaps you already knew it, but that that over time you developed well, that skill as a leader. No, no, I got it horribly, horribly wrong. I did things to people which I genuinely thought they were gonna love. And I was devastated when I found out how much I'd upset them. Fortunately, I didn't. I didn't ever break a relation so badly that that uh, you know that, that that we ended up with you know personal grievances and things. But yes, I I genuinely did things in good faith, thinking that if it was me in the same situation, I would be so over the moon. And God, did I get it so badly wrong? Um, and I yeah probably still bear the scars, which is which is why it's a you know such a key lesson. Um, for me, and to be honest with you, Campbell, I, I'm still making mistakes even now. Don't tell anyone. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> we all do, right? It's you, if you're not learning, if you're not learning and growing and making mistakes, you well. If you're not making mistakes, you're not learning and growing, right? Because that's where you learn the most from when you get it yeah. wrong. It doesn't necessarily make it lovely to go through, but that, that tends to be where it is. Um, feedback's a real biggie, um, and a lot of people. Almost everyone I know, including me, feedback, especially if it's negative, still stings. And it's very easy when you get feedback to 
react in a way that discourages, especially if it's your direct reports, because they watch everything you're doing, everything, not just the words you say, but everything that you're doing and the response and all those subtle little so subtle little clues and tells that might make them think that you don't like what they're saying because it's hard to, to give feedback. Um, any thoughts around feedback and how you can encourage leaders to better encourage feedback from their direct reports and from others around them? Yeah, it, look, it's it's a really it's a really good point, and I'm going to talk about the balance again because one of the things I got told in my career early in my career is is that is that professionals act as they must, not as they feel. Um, and you know, the example I always I always give is you know I I, I go into a shop, uh, I'm looking for customer service. I don't really. You know, if 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 the assistant's just being yelled at by somebody thirty seconds before I turn up, um, you know, I'm I'm, I, you know, yeah, look, don't get me wrong. In this modern world, I have sympathy with them, but you know, when I turn up, I'm just expecting to get you know a smile and some positive customer service, right? And I probably yeah. don't give it too much thought um, around those sorts of things. And so, if you're in a service industry, especially something like hospitality. Um, you know, you know that you have to plaster a smile on your face and, um, you know, greet every customer, even if even if someone's just giving you a hard time. I, I mean, I reflect back to my time as a sailing instructor and um, slightly different. I used to go out and get horribly hung over. But, you know, I had to be there at 7.30 the next morning, smile on my face, full of energy, ready to take people out sailing for the day. I didn't want to hear about that. I had a cracking headache and I wasn't feeling, you know, it was all self-induced. So I have no sympathy for myself, but... Um, you know, so so professionals act as they must, not necessarily as they feel. And so, you know, you do need to create a safe environment for people to give you feedback. Um, and so if people tell you things that, you know, can sting and quite often, um, you know, the, the good feedback is the feedback which is accurate, which sometimes we don't want to hear because looking in the mirror can be quite hard at times. Um, and, and so, yeah, you need to create that safe environment. If, if people are going to tell you things you don't want to hear, you, you, you have to take a deep breath and you have to look to be positive about it. You can make the decision about how you respond, right? Um, and, um, you know, and I, I wouldn't say that every piece of feedback I've ever been given, I've agreed with or, or acted on. Um, so you still have the right to choose, but you, you, you do need to take a deep breath and you do need to say to people, thank you appreciate you taking the time to do that and you know even when you solicit feedback um you know quite often um you have to ask for it often and you have to create an environment that's safe just sitting with your team at the front of the desk with your arms folded saying right i want some feedback from everybody so we can go around the room and you're going to tell me what you think is is not creating a safe environment for people to do that and you you won't you won't get you won't get an honest view um, so you need to you, you need to have that uh, authenticity and you need to give people the opportunity to catch you and you know rather than say give me feedback you, you can just say to people hey I'm not sure I went that well there how do you think I went can you just let me know and then if they don't want to say anything go, that's okay no worries if you think of anything let me know later but just kind of keep dropping those you know those hints every now and again and uh, yeah, eventually um, people will give it to you, especially if they see you acting on it. Yeah. Um, especially if they see some changes that come through because of it. Um, but yeah, you, you, you've got to remember, remember the feedback's for you, but it's all about them. So you've yeah. got to make them feel safe and you've got to make them feel confident. Yeah. And and feedback, any, any feedback that comes in, whether it's um, whatever it is, if you've solicited it or not, uh, or advice, isn't you know, there's there's both about this. It is about you, but it's also about the other person, and, and it, they may have another agenda as well. So you've always got the the, op, the option to to make that call. Right? But if you're if you're always pushing back on it and not taking it on board and not accepting, it, not saying thanks, then it tends to just start not happening. And the further you go up through an organisation, the harder it is to get the the stuff that you need from from the, the the people that really are dealing with clients and customers and whoever else you know your true end end customer is. Yeah, yeah. And the other thing I would say to you is, um, you know, um, we, we all like feedback. We all like to hear. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's quite interesting because, um, yeah, I encourage my team to give me feedback, and they do, which is great. Um, I also work quite hard to give my boss feedback. And it's funny because the more senior I've got in organisations, you, know, you know, when I'm reporting to CEOs and I'm giving my CEO feedback, 
they genuinely go, you know what, actually, since I've had this job, very few people have given me feedback, the more senior we get. Um, and so even if you're promoted um, and you're now a leader and you're going, great, that's cool. You know, when I was in the team, I'd give my boss feedback. Now it's now I'm a boss. You know, it's time for, for people. Now I'm a leader. It's time for people to give me feedback. You know, make sure you keep passing it up the chain as well. Because yeah, yeah. it doesn't matter, doesn't matter, you know, where you are in the in the hierarchy. Um, you you always you always need need that feedback from people. So so you know, even about how, how you encourage feedback from from others, you know, make sure you're providing feedback um as well. Yeah, yeah, that's good. That's really good. Paul, you just talked then about no matter where you sit in the in the in the chain, if you like. Um going from a from being a, a technical expert professional into a leadership role is a big change. But there's another big change that happens in our leadership roles, which is going from leading people that are doing things to leading other leaders that are that are, have their own teams. Um, you've been through that. Um, can can you just talk a little bit around the difference between leading a team of people that are doing things and leading a team of leaders that have other people reporting to them? Yeah, um, yeah. So there are yeah there are some differences, but there's, there's also a lot of similarities um as 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 well because if you if you envision if you envision you you were a technical expert and you've now become a leader so you're kind of um you know changing um you, you know you you used to do this role you're now doing a different role um and and so when you become a leader of leaders you, you actually go through the same transition you you you, you know you move from a role where you where you're basically working with 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 people um who are who are delivering and, and now you're just once again making a transition and now you're working with people um who who are who are leading um rather than you know delivering um on their own so um but in both in both um in both cases you should have an understanding of those people, right? So when you were a tech specialist and you became um, a leader, you understand the tech specialists who are working for you or to some degree because you you used to do the job. When you become a leader of leaders, you should understand the people who are now reporting to you because that was the role that you used to do. And so, um, you know, it, it, it is good to reflect on, on, on all the challenges that you had, you know, in that particular role yourself um, and what you were looking out for um, from your um, leader at the time. I mean, I, I always say you can you learn an awful lot from from a from a from a good boss. Um, you actually also learn uh, just as much from from a not so good boss as well. Yeah. Um, and um, you know, so I I I, I kind of um, tell people to sort of you know reflect both ways, um, you know, up the, up up and down the chain. So although your responsibility is is down, um, you know, you still also have a responsibility to manage upwards as well. Yeah. Um, and, and it's important that as a leader, you understand that, you you know, you have to cover, um, you know, cover both bases as well. Um, and so, you know, when you, when you get that job and you, 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 you know, you're leading leaders, you know, I then sit down with my team and, and say things like, well, how are you being clear? How are you making sure the people underneath you are focusing on capability? What are, you doing around those sort of motivational pieces so you, you, you know your conversation moves from you know talking about you know what are you doing to deliver you know what's your role you know in in, in driving you know sort of technology outcomes to now you're talking about what are your things what are you doing about the you know delivering leadership outcomes but once again you you, you know you should have a level of expertise there because you know that's a role that um you know that you've effectively been doing and then once again, there's just a lot of generic things again in terms of holding people accountable, right? And you know, making making you know, and once again, you can use that clear, capable, motivated, just around your leadership yeah. team as well. So, you know, are you clear um, about what you're expecting out of them as leaders? What what you know, and and so you know, you should be asking leadership questions. What what vision have you got for your team? Um, how are you holding people accountable? Yeah, what are the what are the standards that you're working to, and, and provide clarity about what your expectations are, making sure that they are you know they're capable, making sure that they're motivated um, to do those things as well. So, yeah, I'm not really probably answering the questions because I, I see I see a lot of I, I see some differences, but I also see a lot of similarities yeah. in the two things. 
Yeah, no, that's 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 great. That's really good. And and the difference is, is that the people that you're leading are leading other people that are doing things. So when you're seeing something not being done right, or you you you, you don't have a direct connection to the stuff that's being done, that's being delivered, you have to go through another layer. And I guess that's probably one of the biggest differences, whereas there's a lot of similarities. So that's, that's great. Yeah, but then I'd also push back. To, I mean, you're absolutely right. You're absolutely correct. But then I'd also say when you have your first leadership job with a bunch of te- technical people, um, when they're not delivering, quite often it's because they're reliant on another team somewhere else. Right, because you know procurement haven't done this, or finance haven't done this, or you know we've got issues, or the supplier hasn't delivered, or things haven't turned up on, or the business hasn't provided me requirements, etc. So, you know, I, I found certainly in my experience is very, very limited times when you know the people you are managing have things completely and utterly under their control, and there is you know, even you know third parties and third parties involved anyway. So, um, so yeah, you make a good point, but I am going to challenge you a little bit because I even think that first layer, you're still actually probably managing people who are still relying on other people. Yeah, and and also it's a really good point. Um, I'm prepared to be challenged on that one. <laughs> I'll, give you, I'll give you some feedback later. Yeah. <laughs> I don't want to hear it. Um, <laughs> Um, and so it also means that if that's the case, and you don't necessarily have to deal directly with that, um, with solving that problem for them, you could coach and help that person that's doing, that's delivering to then manage the that relationship with the supplier that's not delivering or whatever. So in a way, it's managing through other people anyway, isn't it? So that's a really yeah. good point. Yeah, that's really cool. Um, just... Uh, one more, one more thing around um, leaders of leaders. When you're a leader of leaders and you've just put someone who's come from a delivery role, from a te- you know role of technical expertise into a new leadership role, and they're you know they've got that empty toolbox of of leadership tools, but a full toolbox of uh, of delivery tools. Are there any thoughts or ideas or suggestions you'd have for those leaders of leaders to help make that transition for their new new uh, employee or the new hire or the newly promoted person into that role? Yeah, I mean, once again, I I don't want to keep thrashing the the success triangle to death, but you know, once again, being clear about what your expectations of them are. Um, so, you know, if you're a leader of leaders, you've got a new leader who's just stepped up. You know, one of the key risks is that you know they 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 either. Uh, you know, struggle to delegate, and so they want something done, and then they go, "Oh, yeah, I used to do this, right? I I need a server built, right? So I'm going to ask someone to do it, and then they decide, oh, this person's not going to do a good enough job for me." And before you know it, your leader is now, you know, back down effectively on the tools, um, you know, kind of kind of doing doing the job, um, you know, and 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 so you know, you, you know, that skill around delegation is important. So, but you can call that out, right? You, that's part of the clarity. So. You know, you you would be I would be saying to my new leader of leaders, you know, be clear with your leadership team what your expectations of them are. So how much how much work are you expecting them to delegate? You know, are you you know when they need to help their teams out, how much are you expecting them to do? Um, and and you know, let's let's be clear about that, and let's let's be clear about what success looks like. Um, and I mean, the good thing about these roles is they're full time, so it's not like you. Um, you know, it's not like you 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 get to lead a team and then you disappear for a month later and then come back and see what they've all been up to. I mean, um, you know, we're generally around pretty much every day of the working week, right? So yes, we all get distracted by millions of meetings and demands on our time and all the rest of it. But you know, if you can keep an eye around and 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 um, you yeah, know, give 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 regular feedback loops and you know keep a keep a presence um you know it's really important i mean one of the things that worked really well in covid um was actually the the kind of check-in loops uh, and i do think we've probably um we've probably as an industry dropped off most leaders i speak to say yeah when covid first hit and we we're all suddenly on video all the time actually we checked in with people every morning we had you know a, a, just a social how are you we we did virtual drinks um, because we were very, you know, very um, focused on people's well-being when COVID first hit. Um, you know, now we're now we're um, you know down the line and, and back in the office part time and whatever. We're probably not keeping those um, those close loops um, as tight as we, we could be. And 
Um, I'm I'm probably just as guilty of of, of that. But um, yeah, if you can if you can keep that in, then then you can you can keep reinforcing that clarity, right? And you can say to people, well, how's it going? And you know, what challenges have you got? And well, let let me just reinforce that you know this is my expectation. This is what we're you know trying to do. And actually, you know, that decision to go and build that server is probably not what you know that person should be doing. Um, and so, yeah, you need to have a, you know, you need to have a conversation with them, you know, about setting, about setting those, those, uh, those specific um, pieces. So, um, yeah, and look, I mean, there's loads of leadership courses and and, and great um, material available. Um, I mean, I haven't wanted to delve too much into, you know, what are the skills of leadership, um, you know, but you know, delegation and you know, those sorts of things are, are, are really key. And uh, I'm sure you'll have some great um, people. Um, on uh, on on your podcast to you know maybe delve into those things a little bit more, um, but um, yeah, I mean to me it's those those close feedback loops are important. Yeah, yeah, that, Paul, that's that's fantastic, and the uh, the clarity, capability, motivation triangle that's a, a really powerful tool, really nice, simple visual model that can really help you just focus back on where you need to be when you at at whatever point you are in in the um, in the in the leadership chain. Um, just before we wrap up, Paul, is there anything that I haven't asked you that I should have? Uh, no, I don't think so. I feel we've covered um, a, a, a lot. Um, you did mention a great book earlier, which I haven't read, so I'm going to uh, pick it up. Um, I will just um, highlight um, so some books um, I um, have on my library that I do recommend to people. Um, probably, yeah, they might be getting a bit old now. Um, and also for probably uh, our modern, modern listeners, um, best thing to do is get onto YouTube and find a 20 minute book summary um, because uh, I, it makes me feel very old when I recommend books to people these days, <laughs> I have to say. Um, but um, yeah, so, um, but, but one book I really rate was, uh, it's called First Break All the Rules. Uh, It was a book that was recommended to me when I got my first leadership uh, role. It's uh, by a gentleman called Marcus Buckingham. Um, Probably, uh, it is probably at least 20 years old now. Um, But uh, the subline is what the world's greatest managers do differently. Um, And um, yeah, it's based, um, it's actually based on on work the Gallup organization did around um, staff engagement. Uh, And it's a great book. It talks a lot about um, trying to play to people's strengths. Um, and uh, and I highly recommend it. And so, um, you know, when you're working with individuals um, in your first leadership role, um, I think uh, the learnings from that that book are quite uh, are quite key. And then the other one, and, and you've probably already had people on who've talked about this, but um, but the five dysfunctions of a team by by Patrick Lencioni um, is is well worth looking at as well. And once again, you can either read the book, buy it off Audible, and listen to it, or you know, on YouTube, there's probably a you know, ten-minute podcast that that covers the the kind of salient um, the, the salient features um, around it, and that, that that I would aim more at the leader of leaders, <coughs> because um, one of the things that Lindsay only talks about is the concept of a first team, um, and so it's quite it's quite key when you're leading a team of leaders. Those leaders naturally will tend to relate better to the teams they're managing, and they'll see themselves as part of that team. But for you, as the leader of the leaders, um, you really need to pull that leadership team together as as a first team. And and Lincioni gives you some really good advice around you know how you do that um, and how you make those leaders then work effectively together. To, to, to bring those um, those separate teams. So, um, yeah, so those are two, two books on my bookshelf that I try and refer to, um, and I, I certainly recommend to people. Yeah, they, they, um, those books came highly recommended. I've uh, I've actually not read either of them, although I have read uh, a couple of Marcus Buckingham's other books, well, one of his later books called The, the One Thing, which is an awesome yep. book around strengths, um, yep. and then the, It's the Manager, which is the kind of uh, Gallup book um, written by the Clifton Strengths guys. So, yeah. Paul, that's been absolutely outstanding. Thank you very much. There's some, there's just so much insight in there. Um, love your model, uh, the the triangle around clarity, capability, and motivation. That's that's fantastic. Thank you very much. And hopefully, at some point, we'll we'll have you back on the show again. 
Yeah, sure, sure. And I'd just like to add the caveat. It's not, it's not my model. I'm not smart enough to have come up with it. So uh, this is stuff I've just plagiarised off others. So, uh, But yeah, look, really, really appreciate the invitation. Thank you, Campbell. Um, I, I'm, I'm very grateful to, uh, to, have, uh, to have come along. And um, yeah, look, um, I'm, I'm on LinkedIn, uh, like pretty much everybody else these days. So if anybody needs to uh, reach out to me, please, sir. Uh, Feel free to flick me a message on on, on LinkedIn. Otherwise, um, yeah, look, Campbell, you're doing such a great job um, with these podcasts and the uh, contribution you're making to the tech community in New Zealand. So uh, I, for one, would like to applaud you and say thank you so much. We're uh, we're extremely grateful for for everything you're doing as well. So feedback from me is uh, is, is is this is awesome. Keep up the great work. Um, I know it's making a difference to people. So thank you. Brilliant. Thanks very much, Paul. Always great to get good feedback, and I'm sure you'll give me that other feedback that we talked about before afterwards. <laughs> See you later. That's been great. Thanks. All right. Cheers, mate. Thanks for listening. If you have a friend or a colleague who would benefit from this episode, please pass the word along. If you have a friend or a colleague who would not benefit, but you haven't been in touch with them for a while, give them a call iTunes reviews are great to get the word out and to help me create the show that's most useful for you. And if you're frustrated or having challenges or would like some help, guidance, assistance with your first leadership role, then check out integrationcatalyst.com in the link in the podcast notes below. Or pass this on to your boss to nudge them to get you the help you really need to cross the doing to managing chasm and get you powered up on your leadership and management journey. Oh, and if you want to make sure you don't miss an episode, hit subscribe. Until next time.